and welcome to another episode of the F1 Breakdown Podcast. The season has finished. We now know that Sebastian Vettel is the world champion and it's kind of sad now. We have 111 days. The countdown has already started on our website to the Australian Grand Prix in 2013. In March 17th, I believe, that Grand Prix will be taking place. And 111 days it is until the Grand Prix. So the countdown has already started. But before we look forward to 2013, let's talk about the Brazilian Grand Prix. And, of course, you know, with the weather playing its part, it was going to be an absolutely thrilling Grand Prix. And I was on the edge of my seat, literally from the first corner. Because I remember watching the start and I was just thinking to myself, is it going to be Vettel's day today? And I knew just from how this season has been, there was going to be loads of twists in that Grand Prix. And we were packed load of twists in that Grand Prix. There were so many twists and turns. You didn't know where to look. You didn't know, you know, it was so good to watch. It really... I kept saying, I went from, you know... Abu Dhabi Grand Prix being the one of the best Grand Prix. Well, we initially trying on my first podcast before, and then they went Abu Dhabi, and I went Texas, <laughs> now Brazil. <laughs> it's just like every race, the last couple of races, has been absolutely fantastic. And, you know, it's been a real credit to the sport, because I think it would have definitely um, incorporated more fans. And the people I've been talking to around, you know, have really gone into the last couple of races of the end of the championship before the one who normally wouldn't talk to me about F1, which is. You can see how exciting it has been. That has attracted the new fans, which is so great to see. We had a Brazilian Grand Prix. I knew when Vettel was down in, in that first corner and he was already behind it, Alonso was in front of him. I thought, this is going to be a Grand Prix to watch. And then, you know, we're going down into turn four and Raikkonen all nearly smashed it into the back by locking up, by breaking too late. And I really thought he was going to hit him, but, you know, Raikkonen knew that Vettel was a car in front of him and he swerved out of the way on purpose. Which, to be honest with you, for credit, to not ruin the championship fight. But the championship fight was ruined, about, uh, nearly ruined a second later. When Vettel turned in, and Bruno Senna was there to just collide into the side of him. And I couldn't believe it, because I was, watch- I was watching TV screens, and I was like, Vettel spun, Vettel spun! And he was like, oh my god! And you c- I couldn't believe it, I thought, I thought he was out, I thought, oh my god, the title is over. With Fernando Alonso, I thought Fernando would get on the podium, so I thought Fernando would do it, but then, you know, he turned the car around. He was still in the race, I don't know how. You know, full credit to Red Bull making the structure the rear of the car really strong because he took a severe hit there from Bruno Senna not once but twice two hits from Bruno Senna and it could have easily damaged the uh, radiator as you remember in Spa in 2011 when Sebastian Vettel hit um, Jensen Button going into the bus stop she came a very similar um, place where he was hit today which broke Jensen Button's radiator and both of the cars were out of the race but it didn't happen there. He was able to continue in the race, and you know it brought on a fantastic race. And it, yeah, I'm still you know speechless because even after that Grand Prix, you know I was speechless. But let's you know continue on on with where we are at the moment. So then the next the next stand that was Nico Hulkenberg. Now I don't Force India said before the race that they had the pace to overtake cars. They had the pace on the two long straights, so they expected a good aggressive drive. And I think that Hulkenberg proved to me that he could be a future world champion. And, I'm, you know, his move to Sauber, some say it could be a move to Ferrari in the future. You know, Sauber is obviously with the Ferrari engine, so there are Ferrari people going to be around Sauber. So, I don't know. He says, obviously, it's not true, that's not true, and I'm, to be honest with you, I think it's kind of not true as well. But you can see the sort of theories behind it, because Nico Hülkenberg showed that he is a truly class racing driver, and I already knew this. Um... I think Nico Hülkenberg has has done a much better performance than Paul Dresta so far in the Force India this season, and I think he's duly um, showed that he is a quality driver and that he deserves a, um, a top drive in the, on, in the top team. Um, moving to Sauber was a bit of an iffy one for me, because well, if Sauber can obviously produce the car that they've had this season again next season with a bit more improvements, so they can fight for a few more podiums, and yes. Because the Sauber overall was a better car than Force India this year, but Force India is still a solid team, and with the backing and the extra sponsorship that is going to Force India and the extra um, backing and funding that they have from VJ Maglia, they could be even stronger next year for Force India. So Force India, I reckon, still be a team to watch. So yeah, but anyway, back to Nico Hulkenberg. You know, he was leading the race. He got past Mark Webber, went past Alonso because of his mistake, completely cleanly past Jensen Barn and Lewis Hamilton. You know, fantastic. I can, you know, the force engine leading the Grand Prix and leading it comfortably. You know, he was out in the lead and he was leading lap after lap and he was controlling the pace of the race like he knew. Obviously, he knows how to win races, 
because going down the formulas, um, Nico Hulkenberg would have led races and he would know how to lead a race. So you know, he would obviously know how to obviously lead the race and he led the race really well and controlled it and he was much faster than McLaren. But then obviously later on in that race, McLaren would eventually come back at him. And I think, you know, then there was obviously his collision that he had with Lewis Hamilton, which was unfortunate because um, Lewis Hamilton had gone past um, Nico Hulkenberg through the light. And Hulkenberg was able to keep up, but then there was a lap, the lap cars that were involved. It was Caterham of Hickey Kovalainen, who, with um, Caterham's 11th place from Vitaly Petrov, could make, hopefully, for um, Hickey Kovalainen secure his place in the team for another season, which is truly deserved. I think it would really be harsh if Hickey Kovalainen is not in a car next year, but we'll talk about that later. So, yeah, and then it looked like that Hamilton was turning in. Hulkenberg had the inside, but then... Obviously, when you overtake, there's a trick that you use to hang the person out to drive, which is you over, you overtake, but you then you sort of go a little bit wide to bait the person, obviously run out of road. And that's what he tried to do, but he couldn't do that in that situation, because if he did that, he would hit Hickey Cove Line. So he sort of tried to stop it, and then he was obviously on the greasy part of the track, and the car went into a spin, and it's collided with Lewis Hamilton on his final race with McLaren, and it's taken um, Lewis out of the race. And it's disappointing. For Lewis Hamilton, because that's obviously not the way um, he wanted to end his career at McLaren. There's already talk of him already going back after his spell at Mercedes with um, Martin Whitmarsh saying that he's always welcome back at McLaren. But for now, he is. It was his last race for um, McLaren, so he was disappointed. He thought he apparently Nico Hulkenberg would not say sorry for the collision because he felt he did nothing wrong. It was just a racing collision, and he didn't deserve the penalty. Um, I kind of sort of agree with Nico Hulkenberg, but I feel that he should say sorry. Similarly, from a fact, on a moral point of view, you know, it was Hamilton's last race, and it was probably a horrible feeling for Lewis Hamilton to go out of the race. I think the penalty was a tad harsh, but you can understand why the penalty was given. So, it's a 50-50, but if penalty was given, I can't really go against it. He did cause Lewis Hamilton to go out of the race. It was kind of hit his fault, probably going in a bit too deep into turn one, but yeah. But apart from that, neither Hulkenberg had an absolutely fantastic Grand Prix. And then obviously with them two going out, it promoted Jensen Button up to the first, and it promoted Fernando Alonso up to second, um, after he had overtaken Felipe Massa, which was obviously a done deal. Um, but Vettel was um, in seventh, he had to overtake Michael Schumacher, which Michael Schumacher um, allowed him to do, because I knew that was going to happen, because Michael Schumacher was already talking before the race that you know, he's good friends with Vettel. I thought to myself, would he, because Vettel looks like probably Michael Schumacher's biggest threat at the current time, of taking his seven world championships. Um, he's only 25, Sebastian Vettel. He could have another 10 seasons, 6, uh, 10 seasons, 11, 12, 13 seasons maybe in Formula 1. And he's only got, he only needs four more titles to equal um, Michael Schumacher's record and only five titles to beat him. And he's got 13 years, possibly maybe 14 if he wants to go until he's like 38, uh, 39, more Schumacher's age, to... Um, accomplish that so he has plenty of time to do it um yeah so i don't know if he will be able to do it but there is a good chance because he's got the time available and if he's in a top team i can't see red bull um diedrich matterships is like sebastian vettel is his golden boy so i can't see him giving vettel away and i know there's stories of him going to ferrari but i don't know why he would go for ferrari when Red Bull is so fast, it's just going to see how it pans out in the next couple of years. Because, you never know, know, one day they might have a fast car, next they might have a slow. We don't know what happens, but with the brilliance of Adrian Newey, um, you never know if they're going to have a brilliant car. Um, so that is it, really. Style was the Brazilian Grand Prix. It was a fascinating Grand Prix. Jensen Button, and obviously, it took the lead, went took the lead, finished the lead. Fernando Alonso finished second. But, you know, Sebastian Vettel finished sixth. The race finished under the safety car because the act has not pulled the rest of in the last couple of laps, which, you know, sort of killed the excitement, killed the buzz. But I think it was already a done deal before Paul DeResta had his accident. So, you know, this all goes in well for the 2013 season. Um, if random regulations are changing a bit, you know, the DRS will be limited in qualifying, um, but I don't think that will affect the cars too much. Um, there's a few, obviously, a few slight niggles that changed because there's no point making big changes for 2013. You know, we're getting rid of the step noses, so we'll all have the nice noses that the Marussia um, and um, the McLarens had throughout the season. 
But yeah, but it, it bodes well for 2013. We're still I'm not sure if HRT will be on the grid for 2013, which would be a shame for Pedro de la Rosa. Um, well, Pedro de la Rosa definitely because he's signed for next season. So if HRT were to continue next season, Pedro de la Rosa is a signed driver. Um, the rain car can, if he can bring the money again, then he might be in there again, or maybe even a young driver because Davide Valsecchi, the championship winner of the GP2 series, was linked to that seat, I heard. And um, you know that could be a chance gone to pro- process um, progressing, sorry, into Formula One. So, 2013 season, you know, um, we got Gutierrez now, who's signed for Sauber alongside Nico Hulkenberg. To me, that was a shock decision. Um, I was very surprised, and especially from watching Kamui Kobayashi in the Brazilian Grand Prix, I thought to myself, "Have Sauber done the right thing?" And I think it's too early to judge Gutierrez because I only saw him once in the practice one session. In the end, obviously he wasn't the greatest, but yes, it was just kind of his first proper time in a proper Grand Prix weekend. So we'll have to see how testing goes. But he's admitted himself that he might not be ready for Formula One, and a driver that might not, who it feels he might not be ready for Formula One, of a driver who's established himself to be a solid Grand Prix driver in Kamui Kobayashi, and you know someone who is aggressive and can overtake cars. So I think that's a big risk. Uh, Charles Pick has moved to Caterham, which obviously means that. Um, Vitaly Petrov and Heike Kovalainen will be fighting out for a seat. Heike Kovalainen says, I'm not bringing any money. End of story. Um, Vitaly Petrov obviously will bring money. So it depends what the team wants. But the team, you know, finished 11th ahead of Marussia. And it looked like that Marussia was going to finish 10th. But it was obviously a wild race was needed for the Caterhams to get up to um, uh, 10th place back in the um, championship. Which they got. Um, but... I don't know. To me, Hickey Kovalainen should be in that seat, but to, for me as well, K. Hickey Kovalainen shouldn't be in that seat. Because I don't know. I know it's like a $15 million um, investment that they'll get for that 10th place, but whether, I don't know, K. Um, they finished their three seasons in a now, and you think, well, they should be able to push on maybe, but they haven't. And if they can next season and push on, maybe fight with the tail end of the midfield team, then yeah, Hickey Kovalainen should stay there. But Hickey Kovalainen, for me, should be at a big team, and maybe looking at that force in seat alongside Paul Dresta, um, that could be a good one, or maybe alongside Maldonado, Williams, um, or Williams or like investment, I think, and force India, well, I think force India will sign Jules Bianchi, the reserve driver, they like doing that, but I don't think Jules Bianchi's had it, the amount of test sessions that they gave to Nico Hulkenberg and Paul Dresta, so, you know, confusion is arousing around that, whether Jules Bianchi will be picked, he might have another season as a test driver. Um, so yeah, where else is going on? Williams, Bruno Senna maybe linked to the other Caterham seat, which opens the door for maybe Heike Kovalainen, another driver maybe from a GP2 formula with money to step into that seat. Um, so there's a lot still to um, sort out in Formula 1, so you know, stay tuned to you know our website, f1breakdown.co.uk, to um, find out first who has moved where and what has happened, because... Despite the Formula 1 season being finished now, there's still a lot of talking points still to um, progress and find out for the next couple of weeks going into Christmas. Um, but that's really it for this podcast. It's been, um, it's been our first season coverage in the sport. Our first season will be our birthday soon. 12th of December will be F1 Breakdown's first birthday. Me and um, a few others created a website on the 12th of December of 2011 going into this season. You know, I've had a an absolute ball um, coveraging um, the season. I know going to the British Grand Prix was a big highlight of the season. You know, seeing it for action because I've seen it before in action, but there was like practice days and test days as it was when the testing's not allowed anymore. But you know, I saw the British Grand Prix today, it was phenomenal. I uh, truly want to do it again. I can't wait for next season. I know I got the countdown straight up on the website. Think, oh my god, 111 days. It'd be like 110. Uh, probably the, by the time this has been put out on YouTube. Um, but what have we got to look forward to? We've got... I'm going to do... A, I found an article which was Performance Enhancing Drugs on in Formula 1. Now, only it roused because of the Lance Armstrong thing and Mark Webber called the FIA's drug testing system kind of a joke. Um, he says he doesn't believe anyone is on a performance enhancing drug. And most scientists and physios and all that say performance enhancing drugs won't help um, Formula 1 drivers. But you never know if anyone was using them. And, you know, people have been found 
guilty of them. Anthony West lately has been found guilty in the Moto2 um, series, in, in the motorbikes, of using a performance enhancing drug. So it's all sort of stipulated, and people are now asking questions. And Mark Webber just, you know, he wants the DFI to do a proper um, drugs test to just prove that everyone's clean in Formula 1, and it is a clean sport, and has been clean um, for a long time. Because I believe in 2001, I can't remember what driver it was, but it was a driver of Prost that was done for taking a performance enhancing drug in 2001. So obviously it's been a long time since someone has actually been caught in Formula 1 using a pro performance enhancing drug for, what, 11 years. Um, but, you know, it's always better to be safe. And, you know, and then you think that sceptics will say, you know, Sebastian Vettel... Could he have been on a performance in Antrim for his 2011 season? I'm not going to give it too much away because I'm going to go into it more when I do the podcast on it and a blog. I'm going to do a blog on it as well so that you can either read about it or listen about it, basically. And then I will do a recap of all the teams so far this season. Um, so I'll recap Red Bull, McLaren, Ferrari, all the teams, seeing you know, what happened good. I'll be finding out, you know, the inter-team rivalries, which driver maybe performed better, which might give us an indication of which one should be kept but in reality is not being kept. Like, obviously the Williams one with Bruno Senna and Pastor Maldonado with Bruno Senna finishing more often than the points for Pastor Maldonado had that win. So, still a lot to look forward to. I'll still be posting out a few podcasts every week or every two weeks. You know, for for a while, and then we'll go up to Christmas and I'll take, my, we'll take a break. And we'll come back in the new year, getting ready for testing, and getting ready and getting all the interviews from the new drivers, because everything will be sorted out by then. And then we'll kick off again on March the 17th at the Australian Grand Prix. And for now, that is it. Thanks for listening. You can like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, um, follow us on Twitter. You know, it's all there for you. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you soon.